Hi guys, so we have a new way to deliver this information because I'm not going to be in class on Tuesday. I'll be at the New York Public Library. If you're interested in watching what I'm doing at the New York Public Library on Tuesday, you can follow some of my tweets and you can see them on the front page of my website. I'm actually going to be working with uh, digital preservation of dance from the Mercy Cunningham archive, so it's kind of exciting. But anyway, to get back to, to uh, what we did on Thursday, we started off with a midterm on Thursday, and I know that it was tough, but I really needed you guys to be able to memorize some of the material that were coming out of the whole 19th century and the late 18th century. You only had really nine keywords to define and then one big, huge essay. And as I read over the essay, let me just assure you, I understand that it is a first draft, and what I'm looking for is your thoughts and your information on that. Uh, if you just skipped over doing the essay, then, then you might want to think about going back and just looking at it at a later time or coming to discuss it with me. My op I will have office hours on Wednesday between 1 and 3. I do have email access on Monday and Tuesday, and we'll try to get back to everybody as I can. Okay, so with this video uh, you get an intro to modernism and we're going to talk about T.S. Eliot and Ezra Pound as a warm-up for Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf and that's going to be on Thursday. In one of these visit videos is also an assignment to be emailed to me by Wednesday at 10 a.m. and it's the regular 500 to 700 words and it's going to be our in, our in class or out of class essay for this week instead of having one on Thursday or Tuesday. As for the reading assignment on Thursday, read as much of Mrs. Dalloway as you can, at least half of it, and then read further into that. It can be a very difficult text, but it's also a very gratifying text as we start to take it apart. Now the thing about the works for today, T.S. Eliot and Ezra Pound, they're some of the hardest things that we will have done, and I would equate them with William Wordsworth's uh, lines written a few miles above Tintern Abbey, as well as anything that Coleridge wrote for us, and we're gonna, I'm going to draw some parallels in the talk for today. I'm going to ask you to turn off the video at one moment and go to a YouTube video, which you'll see also in the email, and then I'm going to bring you back and we're going to talk a little bit more about T.S. Eliot's The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Uh, proof Rocket is difficult because it's not a narrative. I know a lot of you really enjoyed um, Coleridge's work because it offered up a, a story or a plot line and it had characters to it. It's not that same way with the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. And I have to say, alongside Tintern Abbey, Prufrock is probably one of my favorite poems out of all of British literature. Okay, so on to the assignment for the day. You have a few things that you're to read for background material. I'm not going to go over those extensively as usual, but there's some things that I do want to be able to point out to you. I asked you to read the 20th century and after history, and you can glean some things from that. And you've got some important dates in the front of uh, the 20th century on page 1827 in your Norton. 1914 to 1918 was World War I. 1922 was James Joyce's Ulysses and T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland published. Uh, 1929, the stock market crash, the Great Depression begins. 1939 to 1945 is World War II. 1947, India and Pakistan become independent nations. 1953, premiere of Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot, and we're going to read uh, a little bit, a little bit more plays than we have been before, so you can get a, a sense of that. 1957 to 62, Ghana, Nigeria, Uganda, Jamaica, and Trinidad and Tobago uh, become independent nations. 1958, Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart. If you haven't read that one, you should read that as well. 1991, I mean, just for fun. 1991 is the collapse of the Soviet Union. 2001, attacks destroyed the World Trade Center on 9-11 and then we're sort of left by the Norton 2001 to 2010 and I'll cover those as we move on through the semester and we'll cover those through Neil Gaiman and some of the works that he's been doing uh, in graphic novels and we're going to talk about that a lot at the end of the semester too. So the historical background that we've got for the 20th century Let's just start with the modernists and you have some key words for today. Uh, here's, here they are modernism with a capital M, imagism which is going to re relate to Ezra Pound, symbolic landscape, which relates to T.S. Eliot, and individual talent, which also relates to T.S. Eliot. T.S. Eliot was also a philosopher and a literary critic, much the way that Samuel Taylor Coleridge was, so it's important for us to consider the relationship of the author and his or her work at this point as well. 
Okay, so moving from the late Victorians to the moderns, you know, we remember that Queen Victoria dies in 1902. And we have a lot of things going on with colonialism with the uh, British at the beginning of the 20th century. We have a movement away from monarchy and colonialism, though. We have a leveling playing field for gender and class. We're going to get women's suffrage in a little while. We have three markers that we're moving out of the Victorian period. Victoria's death in 1902. World War I in 1914, and World War II in 1939. As with when we did the 19th century, science is moving us forward. We have Einstein's theory of relativity. Uh, we have more difficult poetry like T.S. Eliot's Wasteland. As an English major, if you've never tried to read that, I think I've said this before, you should try to read it. But definitely get a version that's annotated, and I think we have one in our anthology. Uh, we also get the mechanization of warfare, and people say that the most advances in technology happen around warfare. Well, sadly, it's start happening as well. If anybody wanted to do a final project on the history of science, or, or on the mechanization of warfare, or the advancements of technology and how it shows up in literature, I would welcome the opportunity to read something like that. We also have a war against the rigidity of Victorian writing. Even though we end with Oscar Wilde, we still are going to have a problem with um, dealing with the strict forms. Uh, remember we had Wordsworth dealing with blank verse. It still had a metrical form to it and rhyme scheme. We haven't quite gotten to free verse as something that's been acceptable in the scholarly community, uh, also by poets themselves. We have, and finally, Freud, psychoanalysis, and the interpretation of dreams comes to the forefront in the 1910s and the 1920s. We've also got Marx is becoming very big, and of course with World War I and World War II, we're going to see the advancement of fascism, and then World War II, of course, is the movement with Hitler. We're going to run fast and furious through the 20th century. We're going to do a lot of skipping around. There's a lot of great works, uh, a lot of Irish studies, anything that you can take with Sam Mayo or Bill Wilson or David Mesher. They do a lot of those things, and I believe that um, Professor Brada Williams and Professor Krishna Swamy do a lot of 20th century and on the American side if you ever get the chance you should probably go and take something from um, Professor Persis Kareem because she'll give you a completely different overview of what it's like not necessarily to be American or British but what the Americans and British define as other that colonized person. On page 208, first we have Ezra Pounds in a station of the Metro. So I imagine that you've come across this before, and if you haven't, there's a few things that I do want you to know about, um, not necessarily Ezra Pound, but his style of writing. If you look on page 208, at the very top we have sort of a description of Ezra Pound, and this is where the description of imagism comes in. It says, in spare, hard-edged poems, the imagists sought to turn verse away from what they saw as the slack sentimentality and fuzzy abstraction, the explanatory excess and metrical predictability of Victorian poetry. Imagism owed a debt to the symbolism of Yeats and 19th century French poets, but it shifted the emphasis from the musical to the visual, the mysterious to the actual, the ambiguously suggestive symbol to the clear-cut natural image. The imagists looked to models from East Asia, haiku for pound, which is what we're going to read, and classical Europe, Greek verse for HDs or read. Their poetry is compressed, achieving a maximum effect with a minimum of words. It's often centered in a sim single figurative juxtaposition, which is going to be our keyword for today because T.S. Eliot does juxtaposition as well. It's conjoining tenor and vehicle without explanation and it typically relies not on strict meters but on informal rhythms and cadences. So as lit majors, most of you have not taken 100W just yet, and that's fine, because at this point I'm going to ask you to use your imagination and to play. Instead of looking for the meter and the rhyme scheme, you're going to be trained in that when you get to 100W, but for right now, in reading Ezra Pound's In a Station of the Metro, I don't want you to know anything necessarily historically about this uh, th this particular poem and the way that it was composed. It's the same way that we would come to Tintern Abbey. We don't necessarily need to equate it with Wordsworth. What we're doing is looking at it in terms of the development of the poet's mind. But when we get to the modernists, 
very unlike the Victorians and very unlike the Romantics, we're not necessarily dealing with the development of the poetic genius. In fact, we're going to totally let go of that for mm, probably the rest of the semester, especially when we get to the postmodernists. So when you get to Pound on page uh, 2008, in a station of the metro is merely two lines of poetry. It's three if you want to include the title. The apparition of these faces in the crowd, petals on a wet black bow. Now most of you probably already read the footnote, fine. I know you're searching for the meaning of this particular poem and are probably thinking, what, what does anything have to do with anything in one line to the next? So what we have to do, first of all, is start to look at the, point, at the parts of speech. This particular poem is composed of prepositional phrases throughout, and it gives it a sing-song. So you say it in a station of the metro, and then we have our first subject or noun. The apparition of these faces in the crowd, semicolon, petals. Again, we have a parallel there going on with apparition. Petals is also the subject and the noun. Petals on a wet black bough. Now, a bough is a tree. So let's just go through some of the images that are being produced here. Forget about what you just read in the footnote, because I know you guys just looked at it. In a station of the metro. So we know that when we're talking about a metro, we're talking about a mode of transportation. We're talking about being propelled forward. We're also talking about it's a station, an area where people come and go, where they get picked up. And then the next line says, almost completely distinct from being in a metro, which represents technology and mechanization, we go to images of people, very ghost-like. And it's not individuals they're in a crowd and they're apparitions because we can't see their faces and we're not intended to notice their faces. And then the next line takes us out to nature. So we still have the romanticist ideal of nature coming back in, but it's not associated in any way with the apparition of the faces unless you start to think about the image of the petals on a wet black bough. Petals on a wet black bough from a tree might indicate some sort of blossoming tree with small petals, and we have them around San Jose State. They're either, either apple or cherry blossom, and usually they're pink or white. So it's intriguing that we, we relate these numerous amounts of people in a crowd, these numerous amounts of petals that you know when it rains, they go everywhere. They're on your shoes, you carry them. It's almost like you're taking nature with you. But when they get stuck to a wet black bough, they start to stand out, but more as a clump and not as individual petals themselves, very much like the apparitions of the faces. See, the deal is that when we start to parse and look at the parts of speech in this particular poem, we want to look for what's being modified. And when you have prepositional phrases, they're there to modify one noun, usually. So apparition in that first line is what's being modified. The faces modify apparition. And then we get to the second prepositional phrase, and we can't be sure if that one's modifying faces or apparition. And we don't necessarily get that in the second line. Petals are being modified by bow, which is the noun of that prepositional phrase. The two adjectives, wet and black, modify bow. Okay. But the top one, the title, in a station of the metro, has no noun to modify. So you have to link the two of those together. All right. What I'm providing you here is food for thought. There is no one meaning for this particular poem. In fact, because it's so brief and so reliant on the juxtaposition of images, you can come up with as many meanings as you would like. You also notice that there's no end rhyme scheme, and we looked a little bit at that when we talked about dramatic monologue, especially with the Brownings and when we looked at sonnets. This blows everything out of the water. So what do you think it means in the end? This is one of those experimentations. Today, I think the topic was called disillusionment with the Victorians and the Great War. 
And this is the literary reaction to being disillusioned with 70 plus years of literary movement.